Good afternoon. I'm Senator Gary Daniels from District 11. Today we'll be holding a meeting of the Senate Finance Committee. Before we get started, I'll read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of the Senate Finance Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We're utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to, to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform and the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom or YouTube and via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We have provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. We are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are any problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remotesenate at leg.state.nh.us or call 603-271-6931. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, it will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking roll call attendance. When each member states his or her presence, please also state where you are and if anyone else is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. I will call roll. Senator Morse. Senator Chuck Morse, I'm in the Senate chambers. Senator Hennessy. Good afternoon, Aaron Hennessy from Littleton. I'm in the Senate chamber. Senator Susi. Senator Guida. Senator Bob Guida, District 2, present in the Senate chamber. Senator Rosenwald. Cindy Rosenwald from Nashua, I'm in the Senate chamber. And I'm Senator Gary Daniels, I'm in the Senate chamber. And uh, Senator Reagan is excused for the moment. Uh, at this time, I would invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. And we are going to start this afternoon on a health and human services uh, divisions that are on hold. And we'll start with the office of the commissioner. Are there any items there that anyone wishes to take up? Mr. Chairman, the, um, Morse. yeah, there's a couple of things going on. Number one, um, I think Senator Hennessy and I will need a recess at some point today to go over LBA delivered a document from a meeting, you know, we had on Friday um, to account for um, the $50 million back of the budget reduction from the house side. The Senate um, worked with the department has a plan. Um, I think there's one item in here. I need clarification before I propose it. Um, but um, right now that reduction is um, 28 million in general funds and 32 million in uh, federal funds or other. Um, so it's $60 million reduction. 
Um, having said that, the uh, we're on Office of the Commissioner, uh, item number two. I would move. Senator Moss moves item number two. Uh, this is the uh, agency request to add funding for deferred IT maintenance projects to ensure that deferred maintenance backlog does not continue to grow. Is there a second? Second by Senator Guida. Senator Moss, did you wish to speak to this? Um, are these one-time funds? Are these? I think is Karen on. Uh, Karen. Yes. Is yes. These are deferred maintenance projects, and I I think it's appropriate to consider them one time at this point. I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't catch all that, Karen. I heard I heard you you say that these are deferred maintenance projects. Then I'll. Sorry about that. I heard. Okay, now we should be connected to my headphones. I'm sorry about that. I forgot that I needed my headphones. For the meeting. Um, those are deferred maintenance items, and I think it's appropriate to consider them one time at this point. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. You said something about at this time. Yes, at, I think it's appropriate to call them one time. Yes. Oh, okay, call them one time. All right, thank you. Senator Guida. Sorry, I wasn't on speaker. Can you confirm that none of these funds will go towards the Unite Us closed loop data uh, management system? Uh, the, no, the current contract is not budgeted in this class line. Thank you. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Is this the for MMIS? No. New Heights? Uh, I believe that New Heights is is fully funded in in what in our current budget, current proposed budget that the Senate has. Okay. Further discussion. Chair will state that uh, Senator Reagan has joined us in the chamber. We're on number two on the Office of Commissioner. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion on the floor is to uh, ex, uh, to approve the funds requested. Senator Morse? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator Susie? Yes. Senator Reagan? Yes. Senator Guida? Yes. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Yes. And the chair votes yes. And we have accepted item number two. Senator Moss. I will move item number three out to pass. Senator Moss moves item number three. That's seconded by Senator Hennessy. This is an item requested by the department that adds funding for the DHHS facility maintenance projects. Any discussion? And I believe that uh, these again, I believe are one-time funds. Senator Guida. Question of the department. <clears throat> um, this facility maintenance projects, is this in any way associated with the fund that DAS has established for ongoing maintenance? Or is this in addition to that? It, it's not because DHHS, uh, sorry, I should back up. Department of Administrative Services does not maintain our 24 hour facilities. So New Hampshire Hospital, Glen uh, SYSC, so it, it is not related to them. Thank you very much. Further discussion, Senator Hennessy. Thank you, Karen, can you tell me, are any of these funds going to SYSC? 
I would need to go back and look at the list. I think there was a small project maybe on there, um, but given the discussions that are happening, we would reevaluate um, the need to do that project. Thank you. Further discussion, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Are any of these funds going to the Sununu Center? I believe that was the question that Senator Hennessy just oh, asked. I'm so, it's really <laughs> impossible for me to hear Senator Hennessy over there. <laughs> Uh, so the answer is, I believe that there was a small project in this list, um, and we would reevaluate that now um, that there are other discussions going on around SYSC. So there, 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 she believes that there is a small project in the list, but they would reevaluate before spending the money on it. Would they reevaluate it by coming back to the legislature? No, we would probably not do it and lapse those funds. Do you, do you know what the value of that project is? I don't off the top of my head, but I can find it in just a few minutes. Could we hold on this? Yeah, well, we'll wait till we get the uh, figures from Karen on that. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll, we'll hold off on the vote until we get uh, an answer from Karen. In the, in the meantime, are, are there, is there any interest in any of the other things under the Office of Commissioner? <clears throat> I was asking if there were any other items under the Office of Commissioner. It would be just for discussion. I don't want to take another motion since there's already one on the floor. Senator Rosenwald? Just um, let's hang on to number five in case we need it in conference. Okay. Senator Guider, did you have a? I'm looking at. <clears throat> Big, big ticket item number four, but what's that all about, Karen? She may be busy looking up. Sure, hold on just one second. I just wanna... All right, uh, so if, if I can just answer the question on number three, uh, it is a total cost to $85,000 in fiscal year 22 only, of which $64,702 of that were general funds. And the, rem the remain, uh, then 18,538 and 50 cents were federal funds and $1,759 and 50 cents were other funds. Okay. Um, so number four, Number four is the project that Alvarez and Marcel came and presented on when we were doing our department trans, uh, presentations. They presented uh, both in the, during the OCOM presentation on the uh, projects that are currently funded, which is the current $3.3 million appropriation. And then at the beginning of the long-term supports and services presentation presented on the 6.96 that currently is not funded. And so there's a couple of purposes to that uh, 6,960,000 uh, that are within long-term supports and services, but pretty much are all related, to, or, or not pretty much, they are all related to developmental disabilities. And so um, one of the, the projects that they recommended that we are undertaking is, the, um, is looking at the waiver structure and the rates in the DD system as well as uh, the costs of, um, of people that are currently out of state. And so the majority of that 6.9 million is actually related to the costs of the people who are out of state. So currently we have um, many people out of state from Massachusetts to Florida um, and the, the facility in Florida called Neuro International their rates vary anywhere from $200,000 to $400,000 a year per person. 
And so what these funds are for are one-time funds to offer grants to um, encourage facilities to open up within the state. When we uh, have to send someone to out of state, uh, Neuro, the facility like Neuro International sets the rate and tells us how much we will have to pay. There's uh, you know, some room for negotiation, but not a lot. And so if we had those types of facilities in the state, there would be um, a lot more opportunity to work with them and um, to be able to set rates. And, uh, and then also as far as uh, care to have those people closer to their families. Thank you. Can you give us an estimate or ballpark of what these out-of-state placements are costing us currently per year? So, yes, I used to know the number off the top of my head, but hold on, I can calculate it fairly quickly. It's, it's definitely in excess of $5 million a year. So it, it, it's quite expensive. So the, the payback on those grants would happen fairly quickly, probably within a couple of bienniums. Did you say 500? What was five the number? Million. At least five, $5 million, at least $5, five million. million a year. And if you know how, roughly how many people that apply, are being cared for out of state? Oh, it's, it's more than a dozen. I don't remember the exact number. It could even be more than 20. It's, it's quite a few. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Could Mrs. Rounds please repeat um, clearly what the amount of money for the Sununu Center is in number three. Uh, so it's, it's only in fiscal year 22, the total cost was $85,000, of which 64,702 was general funds. 18,538.50 was federal funds and $1,759.50 was other funds. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there, are there costs for this Sununu Center beyond what shows in their budget in DCYF? but is in the office of the commissioner for yes. utilities, something like another $2 million? I don't know that it's $2 million. I thought it was about six to $800,000 a year in utilities that is currently paid out of the office of the commissioner budget. Yes, a year. So somewhere between 1.2 million and 1.86 million additional for Sununu Center that doesn't show up in their budget, but is yes, in the I, office of commissioner. I believe in our 22-23 proposal, though, we did um, make the request to have those paid out of SYSC's budget. What? I believe those are included in the SYSC budget for 22-23 in our request. They're not in the office of the commissioner, but I need to confirm that. Okay. Senator, I believe you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, the motion before us is the approval of the department's request to add uh, approximately a little less than $4 million uh, to uh, funding for DHHS facility maintenance projects. Ready for the vote? Senator Morse. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Susie. Yes. Senator Reagan. Yes. Senator Guida. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And the chair will vote yes. Okay, we'll now go back to number four. And uh, is there a is there a motion on number four or just discussion? Just discussion, Mr. Chair. Senator Guida. Uh, Karen, can you? I thought I understood that if if this were approved, it would be to enable providing grants to current. New Hampshire providers that may not have facilities 
uh, to enable them to upgrade and then return the out-of-state placements to New Hampshire. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And has there been any interest, has there been any proposals sent out prior to this asking for, you know, uh, RFPs to be responded to? Not yet, uh, because right now we're really July 1, we would just enter, enter the stakeholder phase because, it, like I said, it is part of a larger project looking at the waivers and the rates as well. Um, so we would be engaging after the start of the new fiscal year. Further discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. And I don't know that I, just thinking that through, I'm not sure that I really did fully answer that question. We do issue requests to place people in state before we place them out of state. So right now we are not finding that there is capacity in state. Follow up. So, so and that's a matter of the capabilities of existing facilities with respect to the condition of these out-of-state um, uh, people? That's my understanding that they're the, whether it's the facility or, or staffing, um, that they're just not able to provide it. So our hope is to provide these grants so that they can uh, get to a place to provide it. Commissioner, can you can you justify the need for another seven, uh, close to seven million dollars on top? Uh, is it on top of the three point three that's already there? Sure. So um, I I do uh, I do just want to say I, I'm not commissioner. I don't want that promotion, but thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, um, so the 3.3 that's already there is related to the other projects that Alvarez and Marcel identified. So it's the uh, increasing the 4E claiming rates, which is in DCYF, um, moving towards an IMD waiver, which is uh, to be able to um, fund Medicaid patients who are in um, mental health facilities like New Hampshire Hospital. Uh, and it is also to fund uh, CTI, which is critical time intervention, which is uh, something that has been piloted in the state, uh, but actually uh, needs to be rolled out to the entire state and should reduce readmissions to places like New Hampshire Hospital. So that 3.3 funds those other projects. So right now there isn't any funding uh, specific to DD. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Karen, you mentioned the IMD waiver, um, which I think we would all agree is really critical. Um, you had told us, I think last week or the week before, that um, not having a closed loop referral system would violate that um, our ability to get that waiver. Can you clarify that for us? There's confusion about that in my So I, I don't know those regulations well enough to be able to clarify them for you. The information I provided at the high level is, is the best information I can provide. I believe that an email was sent to the whole committee uh, from Jonathan Ballard uh, that answered those questions. And I would refer you to that email. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I believe Jonathan, John Williams sent the email as well. It did not come directly from John, Jonathan Ballard. Got it. Thank you. All right, so we, we've had discussion. Uh, is there any other action anyone wishes to take under the Office of Commissioner? Seeing none. We will go on to the we're going to hold item number five on that uh, go on to the division of economic and housing stability Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Um, are we able to take up anything from House Bill 2 today or are we? 
Are we'll we able to take up what? House Bill 2 items today. Yeah, we're listening upstairs. So okay. we can pick up if we make a motion on those. Great. So I would like to move items number one and four on child care. Senator Mr. Rosen. Chair? Yes. May I ask a point of order? Yes. I think there was a motion on OCOM number three that never got voted on. And maybe that was the intent. I'm sorry. I just. Uh, there was a motion. We, and we, we, did have, we did have, we did have a motion. Um, I get, I don't recall if we had to vote or not. No. On which item? Going, going back to the office of commissioner number three. Uh, I think we. Seven nothing vote. That's what I wrote down. Okay. I apologize. I'm having a Monday. Don't mind me. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So now we will, we will go back to the uh, Division of Economic and Housing Stability. Uh, Senator Rosenwald is moving item number one and four. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Senator Susi. Discussion? So, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. These are two. Um, different aspects of the um, child care programs that um, I think are necessary to get people back to work. The, the first item, the money item, is for certain at-risk children and at-risk families to make sure that they have access to safe quality child care. Um, that's the prevent and protect cases. The second item, the House Bill 2 item, um, would put into the statute something we did, the department did at one point during this uh, past fiscal year, which was to help sustain child care centers by reimbursing them based on the enrollment of children rather than the attendance of children. And so if a child was out because someone in their family was ill or had an exposure, they or someone, um, well, if the child was out sick, they, they would not be penalized. So it was a, it's a sustainability proposal and it is a an important um, suggestion from the child care and early childhood learning community as a way to make sure we have the amount of child care we need for all the people who are going to go back to work. Thank you. Further discussion, Senator Hennessy. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if Senator uh, Rosenwald would mind splitting the question. Um, no, that, that's fine. I'll Voting separately on them. And move item number one. Okay, so Senator Rosenwald uh, uh, withdraws her previous motion and moves item number one. And I'll take that. Senator Susie yes. uh, seconds that motion. Discussion on item number one. I guess li listening to Senator Rosenwald's explanation of what this is, I, if if that child care is needed, why have the cases been closed? Because it says that the these the are the department would do a better explanation. Okay, no, recognize of who these kids are than I would. Recognize Karen for that. Can I ask? Can I ask that Chris Antonello and Rebecca Lorden be brought over? Sure. Thank you. Are you able to hear me? We can. Oh, great. Good, good afternoon. This is Chris Santanello, Division Director for the Division of Economic and Housing Stability. Can you please repeat your question? I, it related to number one. Sure. Uh, the description of this says add funding for child care for families 
whose preventive and protect or protective cases have been closed by DCYF. And my question was, you know, if it, uh, according to Senator Rosenwald, it was uh, for the, these cases, but the cases have been closed. And I'm wondering why we're giving uh, money to cases that have been closed as opposed to focusing more on those that are open. So I'm going to, um, Rebecca Lorden is also joining us so she can jump in, but we also, this fund is used um, for two areas. So there, there may be families that we're serving where childcare is critical for them to prevent involvement with the Division for Children, Youth and Families. And so we have, they're involved through our comprehensive family support programs and we provide childcare that is very targeted for a certain period of time to see if that enables families to not become involved with DCYF. Is that something that can be supported? And then the protective cases, these are for families who are involved with DCYF, but also need some form of childcare to help round out their services plan. One of the issues um, we have had in the past is if we use childcare development funds, a family is eligible for 12 months, regardless if they still have the need. And so it becomes cost prohibitive for us to use the community development finance, I mean, the CCDF dollars, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, the child care development funds um, instead of using the um, general funds for this. Rebecca? I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I believe that the word closed is uh, a typo because that is not the case. These cases are open or they are it's to avoid becoming a case. And that would be with the FRCs. But for the most part, these are children that may have been removed from the home and they are in preventive or protective services. Okay, well, I mean, that, that, make, that makes a world of difference uh, with, with that word there. Um, so I understand that currently the, the House and the governor's figures have matched at 4 million uh, for the biennium. So what this is doing is asking for 3 million more on top of the four, is that correct? Correct. Questions? Senator Hennessy? Yes, I have a question. I don't. I'm looking at page, oh, no, no, I found it, thank you. Okay. Senator Guida. Just a question for the department. What is, what is the department's definition of child care? Is that, it's not day, I mean, in my mind, it's, not, it's daycare, but I suspect it might be different than that. Can you clarify that? This child care, we, child care and daycare can be used um, intermittently. Um, I think the, the terminology is you want to care for the child. Um, so that's why we use the word child care. Um, for, a, for us to use protective and preventive funds, um, this must be in a licensed or licensed exempt child care facility. Thank you. You're welcome. Further discussion? The motion before us is the adoption of item number one. Seeing no further discussion, Discussion, we'll call roll. Senator Morse. Senator Hennessy. No. Senator Susie. Yes. Senator Reagan. Yes. Senator Guida. No. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And the chair votes no. And we'll take up next uh, item number four. It's moved by Senator Rosenwald, seconded by Senator Susie. Discussion, Senator Guida. I have a question of uh, Senator Rosenwald. So, 
is this going to change the current method of payment? I'm not familiar. That's why I'm asking this. When you say we'll provide enrollment-based payment um, as opposed to what other? As opposed to attendance-based. So um, the current, current method is if a child is eligible for the child care scholarship, the licensed facility gets paid for the days the child is there. But if the child is out sick or can't go in because someone in their family has been sick, that center doesn't get paid for that period of time. And so this would change that reimbursement to something the department did at one point during uh, the previous fiscal year during the public health emergency so that if a child was enrolled, they would, they would get reimbursed even if the child was out sick. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. So I can understand the department switching to an enrollment base to carry us through the economic maelstrom that, that tanks so many of our businesses. But are we not on a, on a back on a footing at this time that would allow them to return to an attendance base? You know, what will the figures for attendance? Uh, you know, if we're still seeing uh, nobody going there, two concerns arise. One, um, if they're not going there now, how long before they will go there again? And and would you consider um, amending this to make it only for one fiscal year? Well, I mean, the child has to be enrolled. So the family has a financial commitment. There's, it's a sliding scale. So some families don't pay anything, but a lot of families pay part of it. They're not gonna wanna pay it if they don't enroll their child there. So um, I believe that families wanna be able to go back to work and have their child attend. Um, I guess we could do it for one year, but um, I don't know whether that would be disruptive for the centers. And I guess I'd like to see what the department thinks and also Senator Hennessy, who is the co-sponsor of this amendment. Thank you. And I just wanted to add, this is a HB2 amendment because we, this is kind of a direction for the department to use it, the millions and millions of dollars in childcare funding that's coming into the sp state specifically to bolster it up, um, to use it, part of it in this way. And if I could continue, yeah. Some also, I don't more. believe that all of that extra federal money that's coming in has to be spent in one year. I think we have it for the biennium at least. At least. Further discussion, Senator Gaida. So would this item then exclusively use federal funds or is there a general fund ex expenditure as well? This, um, this would add look at the language it's really about the federal funds it's a footnote that um directs the department to be able to use the federal funds but adds this provision about enrollment based reimbursement to the footnote the, the language says to the extent allowable by applicable federal federal yeah. regulations you would use federal recovery funds, but it also says uh, that the Department of Health and Human Services shall be responsible for determining on an ongoing basis through June 30th, 2023, whether there is sufficient funding in, in an account uh, to fund employment related child care services to avoid a wait line. And it's it, a lot of federal funds. A lot of it's like almost eighty million dollars over the biennium for child care. I think. So the guide. So the question remains: Are there any general funds going to be obligated by this clause? Because no. it says to the extent 
possible, that would indicate that there's another source in here. And if we can get extra funds to the extent possible federally, we'll, we'll fund this, uh, this program. So I'm just concerned about you know, general fund ask if it's exclusively federal, I have no problem with that. If, if at any time the, the commissioner determines the funding is insufficient, he or she shall to the extent allowed by applicable federal regulations utilize available federal temporary assistance to needy families reserves to cover the amount of the shortfall. There's, and if I could add, we also have some TANF funds that I wasn't even thinking about in that calculation. I think there's about $5 million of TANF surplus that we could be still spending on childcare. So I'm not looking to appropriate general funds for this. Okay, so conclusively then we can state that there will be no general fund additional expenditure by, by passing this number four. I'm gonna defer that to Karen. Mr. Chair. Yes. And I'm happy to wait for this for Wednesday if if you want that in the in the amendment that Senator Rosenwald and I co-sponsored. Uh, Karen, uh, can you, can you uh, verify that there will be no federal, uh, excuse me, general funds that are part of this amendment? I, I don't know that we could commit to that. I, I would ask Chris and Rebecca, but they did fiscal notes for the bill that had similar language and the estimates were in excess of what we have for federal funds available. Okay. So although there isn't an appropriation with this, it, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't have to transfer funds to be in compliance. Senator Guida? Yeah, I'm not concerned about the transfer funds that are already appropriated. I'm worried about the additional appropriation that might be necessary to garner the release of the federal funds. Further discussion? I guess I had, had, had one question. It could be for either one of the sponsors of this. Um, with everyone looking for help these days and that causing the increase and salaries, to what extent is, is this needed? I didn't hear the end of your, to what extent is? Well, the, the need for employment related childcare. I mean, normally you think of like, like a low income family that needs assistance with the childcare, but you know, you're now paying Wendy, Wendy's uh, you know, hamburgers at $15 an hour and such. So the, the whole lack of uh, workforce has caused, has call, caused salaries to go higher. Uh, thereby, I would think making them more able to take care of their own health care. Well, in Nashua, full-time cost for an infant in licensed daycare is over $15,000 a year. And so even if you're making $15 an hour, it's really expensive. And if you have two kids, you could be looking at, you know, upwards of 25 or $30,000 a year in childcare costs. The, sub, the scholarship phases out and by I think it's 250% of poverty, it's eliminated entirely. This is, this um, reimbursement method is also recommended by the committee to examine the cliff effect, which has been working for oh, a year and a half or at least to look at what happens to families whose income uh, rises to the point where they just are, are not able to qualify for any public assistance programs at all. And childcare is a significant barrier to work for, I guess, lots of people in New Hampshire. Okay. according to that study committee. 
Thank you. Any further discussion? What is the desire on waiting or the, the one year versus? And the motion on the floor right now is to accept the amendment as presented. Seeing no more discussion, we'll call roll. Senator Morse? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator Susie? Yes. Senator Reagan? Yes. Senator Guida? Yes. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. And the chair will vote yes. I may, Mr. Chair, I still would like an answer to my query on whether or not this would increase general funds. Yeah, and I think. Uh, Karen, is that an answer you can get for us? I think the answer is potentially. It, it, so I do think that there's potential that we would need to transfer general funds from somewhere else in the budget um, or come back to the legislature in an off budget year. I mean, that's never our first avenue, though. Senator Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to reconsider our current vote and come back with a different amendment when we look at HB2 on Wednesday that says no general funds will be used for this. Okay. So are you moving reconsideration? Yes, moving reconsideration. Senator Hennessy moves reconsideration of our previous vote. Is there a second? Second. Second by Senator Guida. Call roll, Senator Morse. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator Susie? Yes. Senator Reagan? No. Senator Guida? Yes. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. And I'm sorry, did we say yet? Yes. And uh, chair votes yes. Motion carries six to one. And um, with no objection, we will put this on for Wednesday's, Wednesday's agenda. Are there, are there any other items to be taken up under the economic and housing stability section? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I'd like to move items number two and three. Senator Second. Rosenwald moves items number two and three, and that's seconded by Senator Susi. Discussion? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. This is basically um, Senate Bill 140, which was passed twice by the Senate unanimously. Our, um, Homeless population has increased over 20% from uh, even before the pandemic. And um, I consider it a statewide problem. It gets worse in the cities because that's where services and public transportation are, but people who are homeless are from all over New Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you. And Karen, and are if these? If I could add, sorry. I'm sorry, go we ahead. We reimburse the shelters about $8 a day when the costs are about $47 a day. Okay. And, and Karen, the, these I see have the same account number, but they're, yes. they're different items within that. Is that? Yes. And Chris, do you want to speak to why we put these in as two separate requests? So the. Um, Sure, and Rebecca, I might need you to weigh in. Number three was actually, um, that was the um, change request we put in, Karen and Rebecca, um, for the contracts we had for eviction prevention dollars, I believe. Um, and then item number two is that money, nine million of that would go directly to shelters, um, as Senator Rosenwald mentioned, to increase the reimbursement rate from $8 to about $27 a day. And then that would also enable us to add um, some youth programming um, for which we only have one very small program um, in the state. And this would really help us to target those young adults age 18 to 24 um, with essential services so they can obtain um, and maintain housing so they don't um, experience homelessness. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I had heard somewhere that there was already 10 million in this fund. Is that correct? 
the current budget is about $10 million, yes, which is level to 2021, if I recall correctly. Okay, 2021 is 10 million. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the ending there. The, the current, uh, so 2021, the, and I'm just talking about, I think it's like class 101 or 102, the, the contracts class line or could be 74 is about $10 million. Um, and that is what is currently in the Senate or the House proposed HB1. Um, these are additional requests. Okay, you said uh, uh, class 74? 74 and one of something. Chris, did Karen, you have something to add to that? Yes, oh, I do. Yes, because the um, shelter funding, when we moved forward with our um, biennium budget for 22-23, based on the um, instructions the department had, we moved forward with funding the shelters with our fiscal year 21 budget amount, which actually was less than the fiscal year 20 amount um, due to some um, challenges um, with the shelter system in fiscal year 20, we um, had a shared price limitation that based our reimbursement to shelters um, on people served, not bed capacity. And we had to change to a fixed price limitation so we would not overspend in the biennium. The difficulty that occurred with that is by not overspending in the biennium, the actual fiscal year 21 budget that we gave to the shelters was less than what was in fiscal year 20. Um, and so that actually created an anomaly when we created our 22-23 budget. So shelters on top of not getting fully reimbursed for the services that they're providing, we do have a decrease of about $800,000 in our request for the biennium. That's, ba that's based on your 20 budget, correct? So our 2021 budget, I wanna say was about $7 million for shelters or 6.9 million. Um, and I believe our budget for 22-23 ends up being 6.2 because of the anomaly that happened between 20 and 21. Okay, well, I'm looking at the shelter program and if you look at the total expenses for uh, the actual on 20 and the budget on 21, you're, you're a little over $21 million. If you look at the, uh, at the 22 and 23, uh, the, the governor and house both match with a total of over $23 million. So I'm not following you on the seven, seven, seven million. I don't have that right in front of me. I don't know if Karen, if you can add something. I don't have that budget piece in front of me. Um, I'm not sure where the, the 22 million is coming from. The accounting unit 7927, which is on page 1120. Um, the total budget is about 11.5 million for 22 and about the same for 23. And then 21 was 11.476. So it's, it's just about level funded. That's what I'm saying. You add the 20, 20 actual together with the 21 authorized. You oh, for the biennium. I'm sorry, yes. For the biennium, you're a little over 21 million. If you look at the 22 and 23, uh, they're both about 11.5, a little bit more. So you're at a little over 23 million. So it's, uh, you know, there's actually a, an increase of about $2 million over the biennium. Further discussion? Senator Susi. I think the thing that's most relevant here, though, has been the increase New Hampshire has seen, which was a more than 20 percent increase. Sorry, I think one of the issues is there has been an enormous increase in New Hampshire compared to other states. We've had more than a 21 percent increase in homelessness. And as Senator Rosenwald said earlier, our rate of reimbursement 
is a fraction. It's about a sixth of the cost of what it is to house an individual. And I think there are communities in our state that have been disproportionately impacted. One of the organizations in Manchester, Families in Transition, operates the largest emergency shelter. And it has been a struggle to, under the current funding, um, to be able to provide the services that are needed. So I really think this is an important time to provide this increase for these important services. Thank you for the discussion. Senator Guida. Is there any way that this funding could come out of the rescue plan funds? Right now, right now there is not um, funding for shelter programs in the rescue funds. We did have some one-time money. Um, and again, much of that is one-time money looking at infrastructure, but not ongoing operations. Do we have any idea how much the, uh, the need that Senator Susi was talking about is related to COVID and people losing their jobs? We actually had an increase um, of people experiencing homelessness prior to the pandemic. And I think the pandemic exasperated that. There is a number of people who actually live in shelters um, that have jobs, um, but either they don't make enough money to, for, to afford rent or because there's such a lack of affordable and available housing in the state, um, there's no place for them to move. And so um, as Senator Susi mentioned, we have had an increase of people accessing shelter services um, and an increase of people um, needing um, supports so that they can obtain and maintain housing. But again, shelters are provided less, um, significantly less than what it costs them to keep people safely housed um, and so, any increase in this line would be much appreciated for the shelter system. Okay, thank you. Any Re further discussion? Recess. We recess. Recess. Our committee will be in recess.
Okay, committee will come to order. Uh, we're back on the Division of Economic and Housing Stability. Uh, the motion on the floor is uh, adoption of items two and three. Uh, question whether the maker of the motion is willing to uh, divide and do these separately. Divide it what? D divide two and three and deal with each one separately. Yes. Okay. And the maker of the second uh, does that first also. So we're looking at item number two. Any further discussion on item number two? Seeing none, we'll call roll. Senator Morse. Senator Hennessy. Senator Susie. Yes. Senator Reagan. Yes. Senator Guida. No. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And the chair votes no. Motion fails three to four. Take up item number three is moved by Senator Rosenwald, Senator seconded by Senator Susie. Any discussion on item number three? There being none, we'll call roll. Senator Morse, Senator Hennessy, yes. Senator Susie, yes. Senator Reagan, yes. Senator Guida, yes. Senator Rosenwald, yes. And chair votes yes. Item number three carries. And uh, you'll see that uh, during our recess, there was another small packet dropped off at your desk, uh, something that was prepared for Senator Morse and Hennessy. Uh, what we're going to do is continuing, continue go through DHHS and the divisions. Then we will go back, vote on the department, uh, excuse me, after that, then we'll take up this, uh, that packet that was just handed out. And then uh, eventually we'll get to voting on the department as a whole. So uh, and we have put uh, item number four, which is pertinent to House Bill 2 off until Wednesday. And I think we have taken care of everything with economic and housing stability. Going on to the division of long-term supports and services. Senator Moss. Sure, I will try and LBA can correct me if I'm wrong. In the past, uh, because the rates have been low, the, the, um, the budget for the line items for this has actually not been expended. And so the department has lapsed uh, significant dollars in this category. And so by increasing the rates paid to the providers, the, um, they will actually not need an increase in their budget line is, is my understanding. Okay, thank you. Other discussion? I do have a question. Is there any, is there any guarantee that the rates are gonna be, or, or that the increases will be handed on to the workers? No. Thank you. I'm open for amendment. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I think that would be item five that would do that. Because that talks about um, the homemaker, those two services in CFI that um, I believe would direct number four to, to be uh, used for the benefit of the employees. We're not able to pass through directly. Great CMS wouldn't let us do that. But um, 
I believe that our language in number five would um, make do sure that the, bidding of the Make sure the workers get the money. But I have a question about number four, if I could ask. Yes. Thank you. So, Senator Hennessy, it's my understanding that about 65% of the money in the CFI lines gets actually put towards services. If we raised rates, what if, if, if that was enough to entice a full workforce, it would increase the it would increase the draw on it. There's some balancing point, and we're running up against the limit of my algebra knowledge here. But at some point, you raise it a little, and you get some more services. Is 5% not enough to deliver 100% of what's improved, what's approved, which would increase the need for a bigger appropriation? I'm sorry, I can't be more articulate. Can, can, can you turn your microphone on, please? Yeah, but the, uh, I, I get what you're trying to do here. I guess my question was, did it need money? And the, uh, I'm not sure. So basically, we're not using a lapse from 2021 to give this increase. We're giving it, I'm trying to understand where the, where the 5% is coming from. It's coming from the fact that we're not using 100% of the workers. So if I may, Mr. Uh, Chair, and, and Senator Rosenwall can expand on this, I'm sure. But the the issue with this line is that the workers are not paid enough to retain them, nor is the pay scale high enough to attract new workers. However, they did experience some retention in this um, field when there was a stipend from the CARES Act. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. And item number eight here speaks to the current year appropriation. And it's reflected in item number one of the handout we got when we came back from the recess, where the long term care appropriation from the current fiscal year is carried over of $11 million. So I think. Item number four, five, eight, and one all work together to use current appropriation, make it not lapsing, and try to direct the money to the workforce. So it seems to me we should approve all of them. Although maybe number eight is not necessary because it looks similar to number one. I'll, I'll, I can explain one later, but um, I would move items number four and five ought to pass. Senator Morse moves items number four and five. They're seconded by Senator Guida. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call roll. Senator Morse? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator Susi. Yes. Senator Reagan. Yes. Senator Guida. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. The chair votes yes. Items number four and five have been adopted. Senator, any, Senator Morse. Mr. Chairman, I think every time I built a budget, the I, item one and two, we've waited till the very end. Those are Senator D'Alessandro's. Uh, favorites. Um, I don't know when you're going to take a closing vote on the budget, but I think you have to wait on numbers like that. Probably will be relatively soon. <laughs> it won't be today. <laughs> 
Okay. Anything else we wish to address? Senator Hennessy. I have a question for the department on number three. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Can you tell me what the current rates are and if the 22-23 budget allocates increases in this? Um, so, for adult medical day services. So as of right now, we had slated a, a rate increase for homemaker and personal care in 2152, but with the approval of number four, I don't think we can do specific rate increases. I think we'll need to make it a general 5% rate increase for all the types. Um, so I don't know the specific rates to answer their question on number three, but I think with the voting of number four, it increases the rates in all three class lines. I would also just note that the footnote leaves out one of the class lines. It leaves out 506. Um, I'm sorry, not 506, 50, 505, um, which I believe number four would also apply to 505. So I'm not sure that really answered your question, but I don't have the exact rates on that. Further discussion? Senator Rosenwald? Yes, yeah, so I'd like to move item number three and speak to it. Senator Rosenwald moves item number three. Is there a second? Second by Senator Susi. Senator Rosenwald, you're Thank recognized. You. These are the um, more adult day medical programs, not the, um, not the direct care service providers. This would be like the one that St. Joe's ran in Nashua. There's one in Hudson, I believe that's run by Alvern School. These are out of home, but in community adult day programs. They haven't had um, an increase for several years and they're concerned about their financial sustainability. Senator Morris. Yeah, I, I thought when I asked the question of the department, there was a raise put into these lines. I, I actually served as president of a board on one of these. Um, they don't make money. I mean, that's pretty clear. Um, the, uh, I mean, ours happened to be on the same property as a nursing home. So as you graduated from the adult daycare, you, uh, you know, Unfortunately, you'd be in the nursing home, but um, <laughs> I'd just like to know if there was a raise to the rates in the budget on this line, and what would $2 million do to the rates? So uh, I can have Deb get you that information. Deb Sheets doesn't appear to be in attendance right now. What I would say is, again, with the passing of four, there is a 5% rate increase applied to those services. Those are CFI services. Karen, is there a line specifically for um, adult medical daycare services in the budget? I don't think so, but I will double check. Um, if I do. Further questions? So it sounds as if Senator Moss. If, if they haven't been raised, I would support this. If they've been raised, I'd like to know what they've been raised. And if the amendment, um, if we could vote for three today and not include them in the 5% increase because we're putting, you know, $4 million into a $2 million a year. Um, I would do it that way. I mean, 
5% on $60, I, I don't know what 2 million does for all these places. And I don't know what rate they're at right now, to be honest with you. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. So currently the rate is $54 and change per day. Um, the national average reimbursement for adult day is $77. This would bring it to $75 a day. The cost of these centers is $84. A day in New Hampshire. I don't have when the last um, funding increase was, but this would bring it close to the national average. There are 17 of these centers in New Hampshire. They're licensed and um, they serve almost 800 clients per day. Mr. Chairman, if, if the motion is to approve three, I would just like to have the motion include an amendment that does not include it in four, because it sounds like we're doing, we're going right to where we should be. Um, and to tell you the truth, I was on this in 1995 and I'm willing to bet it was damn close to the number you just read. I would consider your proposal a friendly amendment. So Senator Moss is moving <clears throat> item number three. Um, Senator Rosenwald moved it. I but he's Senator amending Hudson. it. He's amending it. Okay, so someone keep track of the amendment. And, okay. So the motion before us is item num number three as amended. Any further discussion? Senator Guida. Just for clarity, that amendment would be that those institutions covered under number three are not then covered under number item four, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call roll. Senator Morse. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Susie. Senator Reagan. Yes. Senator Guida. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And the chair votes yes. And we've got through item number three as amended. Anything further under long term supports and services? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Item number um, six, um, well, seven. So, um, Senator Morse's amendment number 1450S suspends rather than repeals or requires funding for two different services, one of which has not been addressed. And so I'd like to, if he agrees, amend 1450S to suspend the senior volunteer grant programs if they are different from the foster grandparents program or to the extent that there's more than foster grandparents in senior volunteer grant programs. I thought there were two programs in there. And I'm not sure, I think the department would, would have to comment on that. Karen, you're on. I don't have an answer to that. I'm not sure if um, John Williams is monitoring and might have an answer to that. I, I don't, sorry. Uh, there, I think the two programs are the foster grandparents and something called senior RSVP. And not, I, I see we put a pin in congregate housing and foster grandparents, but we might have to suspend rather than fund senior RSVP if that's not included in Senator Morse's 
Amendment. This isn't going to affect the budget, so if you want, it doesn't. we can work on this till, till Wednesday. It doesn't. If it doesn't really have a cost if we suspend it. All right. So for for the sake of going on, we'll put this on Wednesday. Anything further under the Division of Long-Term Supports and Services? Seeing none, we'll continue on to New Hampshire Hospital. Committee desire any action on either of either of these two items. Hearing none, we'll go on to the Division of Medicaid Services. Senator Morse. Mr. Chairman, I, it probably ties to the document we'll be talking about later a little bit, but the, uh, um, the department, we asked them to come up with a plan for two and three. Um, uh, I don't know if Kevin wants to explain it or the department explain it. Uh, I can explain it. It does relate to that document that was handed out um, did you want to go over that now or wait until the end? Uh, sure. Okay. That's fine. So you have this document, I believe you all have it, that reads prepared for Senators Morris and Hennessy, uh, HHS proposed budget adjustments and total funds. Um, I'll actually address item number two on that first page because that relates to the Medicaid items here. HHS has said that they expect to lapse approximately $17 million in fiscal 21 from the Division of Medicaid Services. So there's some House Bill 2 language on the page that follows that would allow that money to be non-lapsing, roll forward into fiscal 22, and fund the increases that the department has requested. So on your sheet for the Division of Medicaid Services, I'm going back to the recap document now. Item, num item number two would be a reduction to the Children's Health Insurance Program, and that was requested by the department. And item number three would be an increase to Medicaid care management, also requested by the department. The amendments in this document, the second document that was handed out today, would make those reductions to CHIP per the department's request, and you can see those on page three of this document. And it would increase funds for Medicaid managed care. And that's on page four of the document. You can see that the increase in general funds is only 1.6 million in fiscal 23, but that's because as you can read in the explanation down below, the 17 million in fiscal 21 would be made non-lapsing and the department could use it to pay for Medicaid managed care. So the department would have the full amount available to pay for managed care in fiscal years 22 and 23. And all of that can be found on pages one, three, and four of today's handout, both the House Bill 2 language and the necessary House Bill 1 changes. Mr. Chairman. I just want to point out what's going on here. The, when the House was presented on these two items, they were presented with a July 1st ending date um, on the enhanced FMAP. So that would mean they had to carry it three more months um, under that plan. They, it's just the way it works. When this, when this came to the Senate, 
this went out from to I believe Kevin can correct me that the plan in front of you brings it out to September and carries it for three months further. So the Senate was faced with this increase that the federal government was carrying the program on further. And to be honest with you, it may even be further than that in the long run. So all we tried to do was find a way to make this work because if the federal government were to come in and not use September as the dead date on this, which gets us to December, and they would have used three months out from that, and it ended up on, somebody help me, I think there's a date specific, like June 10th, I mean, January 10th, we'd be talking about another three months. They can still do this. They can still accept the funds. They do not have to come to fiscal to accept the funds on this, the way it's being set up in the Senate. They could accept the federal funds from the federal government if this were to go on three months or six months, they would be able to accept the funds and run the program. So that's basically what we asked the department to try and run out a plan to make that work. That's what LBA and the department worked on this weekend. And that's what's before you. Thank you. Any further questions? So Mr. Have, Chairman, having said that, there's nothing else on page nine that I would support. I support items two and three, but I be, believe we're gonna be dealing with those later. Okay. Any further questions, anyone else? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Uh, item number four, um, I think Senator Morse and I had an amendment that would address transitional housing, but I don't see it. It's, it's gonna come on Wednesday, but basically what Senator Rosenwald and I were doing, I think it's coming on Wednesday. Um, what Senator Rosenwald and I were doing were we were taking the laps from this year, which was $2 million, and then we were taking six million dollars. Um, That's in, in your packet. It's number amendment sixteen twenty two S. In twenty twenty one funds um, to come to a total of eight million dollars in transitional housing. Right. Any further discussion on that. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I'd like to move item number five. Senator Rosenwald moves item number five. A seconded by Senator Susi. Any discussion? Yes, it's the bottom of page 10. If I could, Mr. Chairman, we discussed this last week one day. Um, these programs are important for healthy pregnancies, healthy children, um, and there's a, I think this federal match is understated here. It's in here as 50, basically 50-50. Some of these pregnant um Pregnant women are on Medicaid expansion where there's a higher match. And to the extent that the visits are made on the children, there's also a higher match. So I think um, this is a great program and we should fund it. Further discussion. Seeing none, uh, we will call roll. Uh, the motion before us is the adoption of item number five, uh, which 
request adding funding for a additional home visitation services is required by Senate Bill 274 from 2019. Senator Morse? No. Senator Hennessy? Senator Susie? Yes. Senator Reagan? Yes. Senator Guida? Yes. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. And chair votes no. Motion fails two to five. Any further action to be taken under the, at this time under the Division of Medicaid Services? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I don't understand um, <laughs> item number one. Uh, what the impact of not funding, um, not adding these additional general funds for the clawback is. Are we going to need to transfer this money from somewhere else? Yes. Pardon? Yes. Yes. So we're, if we don't do this, we'll be underfunding the Medicaid program by five and a half million dollars of general funds. Essentially, it, it does depend on how long the enhanced FMAP continues for. I'd like to move item number one. Uh, Senator Rosenwell moves item number one. Is there a second? Second by Senator Susi. Discussion? I think this is the one that I, I asked a question on when we met with uh, Health and Human Services. And I guess I don't understand. And I believe the question I asked was whether we paid a set fee for all uh, dual Medicare, Medicaid duly eligible population or would they look at individual ones as to the medications that they need? Because drug plans can range anywhere from $13, $15 up to uh, 80 to $100. And the answer that I got was that everyone paid this, uh, that we paid the same amount for everyone. And I, I really don't understand uh, how or why we, we would be willing to pay you know, $80 for someone who may be taking a, a blood pressure medication that you can get for Walmart for $10 for three months. That just doesn't make sense to me. And maybe, maybe someone more knowledgeable within the department can explain uh, why we can't individual, individualize this. And I, I would guess probably save a, a lot of money because obviously the plan that you're gonna go for is the one that's gonna cover the worst case scenario. Senator Rosenwald. I, let, let me, I, I understand your question, I think, but let me try to phrase it for the department in a different way, if I could. Didn't we, when we went to manage care, which I think was, I remember it was a Senator Bradley bill, but I think there was a decision made to include prescription drugs in managed care. So that's part of the bids that, that go out to managed care companies and they come back with a per, per member per month that includes the optional and required services plus prescription drugs in that one figure? Or is that not correct? Henry, did you ask the question? Can't hear you, Karen. <laughs> I think, I think Karen was looking for Henry. Oh, Henry. Thank you. I'm Henry Lipman, Medicaid Director for the Record. So prescription drugs are included in the managed care program for generally, but for those individuals who are, um, if you will, have incomes low enough that they um, they have Medicare with uh, Medicaid as being sort of the providing the, the wraparound benefit, um, the federal government basically provides for their um, 
their drug benefit under Part D. These are typically people who have a very low income and um, they just bill the state for that, that money, which is very different than the rest of the drugs that are provided in the program. Further discussion, Senator Hi. Moss. Mr. Chairman, while we have Henry on the phone, Henry, can you, on the lines in 2021 um, for the phase down, can you tell me what the lapse is going to be this year? It's going to be um, $649,729 is what we're estimating. The, the main reason we have um, a lapse and we, we actually were able to transfer out some additional funds earlier in the year is because of the enhanced FMAP that came in that wasn't anticipated. And the enhanced FMAP comes in the form of a lower billing to us as a state that the, the rate that we were to be billed was reduced by the 6.2% up front. And that's why we had a fairly large lapse in this account this uh, particular fiscal year. Mr. Mr. follow up. Yeah, it's Monday afternoon, so I'm just coming to life, Henry. Sure. Did you transfer <laughs> $6 million out of this line? Yes, earlier. Okay, so now that's I understand. Yeah. So there's going to be a lapse, and we already transferred out $6 million. That's why on the sheet that we're going to vote on later, we basically said um, this line, because I think it was $48 million, was able to come down by $2 million a year um, in 22 and 23, and that we would let whatever's in this account lapse over to 22 and 23 as part of a plan. I think that was the discussion. I think the, the, the I don't know if Karen can comment here, but I think it's the amount that is lapse, left to lapse versus what the additional billing might be if we stay at the current volume, I think is the, the, the issue that could, could cause us to have to come back on this account. Senator Ross. Yeah. Thank you. So if there's an extra $4 million in the next two years, why, why do we have this five and a half million dollar problem in the item number one, if they're both the phase down? So it depends on how long the public health emergency lasts in terms of the enhanced FMAP if, if it um, ends, I think in terms of what we included in the, the Senate phase, then we would not have the, the same experience in terms of a, a lower rate that we have to pay the feds during um, state fiscal year 22 and 23 for sure. Unlike standard Medicaid as well, the, the caseloads have not changed with this. So, so although we have had to pay less, the caseloads have not changed and will not change at the end of the public health emergency. So do we really have a one and a half million dollar problem, not a five and a half million dollar problem? I'm just, I'm really confused by this. Um, I think in terms of the, the calculations based on the rate that we were provided in advance by CMS, that's, that's what this calculation reflects. Um, and again, I think it's the, un, the unknown here is how long the enhanced FMAP, um, as Senator Morse talked about earlier, you know, how, how long that, that's going to be available to us. I did uh, provide some detailed information on fiscal year 21 and the enhanced FMAP uh, to the LBA. So perhaps they could provide that information to you, Senator Rosenbaum, and that might help. And Senator Rosenwald, you, you had moved item number one. I, I could not hear really anything Karen said. So I, I think I'll withdraw that amendment okay. because I'm just confused. Any other, Senator Moss? Yeah, on page 10, which is under the same division, 
I would move eight, nine, and 10. Senator Morris moves items eight, nine, and 10. Second by Senator Guida. Discussion? Seeing none, we'll call roll. Senator Morris? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator Susi? Senator Reagan? Yes. Senator Guida? Yes. Senator Rosenwald? No. Chair votes yes. We have adopted items eight, nine, and 10 on a five to two vote. Senator Morris. Yeah, I'm gonna to skip to 16, but 15 will be addressed later today, I believe. Um, I, I would move, I didn't realize it was in this document, but this is what Senator Rosenwald was talking about. It was a, you're carrying over $2 million in transitional housing um, in a lapse, and then we'd appropriate 6 million more. So it'd be an $8 million appropriation for transitional housing beds. Senator Moss moves item second. number 16. That's seconded by Senator Rosenwald. And this is amendment 1622S. I mentioned that was in your packet. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call roll. Senator Moss. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Susie. Yes. Senator Reagan. Yes. Senator Guida. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And the chair votes yes. We've adopted item number 16. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I'd like to move amendment number 13, or item number 13, which doesn't have a cost. Senator Rosenwald moves item number 13. That's amendment 1314S, which suspends direct and indirect graduate medical education payments for the 22-23 biennium. Is there a second? Second by Senator Susi. Discussion. Just thank you if I could. This is something we've done for about the last five budgets and it just continues to suspend this. We are seeing some additional re medical residency programs and there's no harm in suspending it. But if we were to repeal it and we ever wanted to bring it back it would be more difficult. You know how many years it's been suspended? Pardon? Do you know how many years it has been suspended? I believe it's been suspended for 10 years. 10 years? I think so. But some of the other things we're suspending also have been like those foster grandparent programs and congregate some congregate services. Okay, thank you for the discussion. Seeing none, the motion before us is item number 13. Call roll, Senator Morse. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Susie. Yes. Senator Reagan. Yes. Senator Guida. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And the chair votes yes. Motion carries. Any further items we acted on? Mr. Chair, I was just like the members to know that I'll be moving 1641 when we talk about the adjustments at the end today. Okay, which item is that? That's number 15. Thank you. Okay, see, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, just would like to move item number 14. Senator Rosenwald moves item number 14, that's amendment 1485S, which requires the Department of Health and Human Services to engage in emergency rulemaking to make home visiting programs available to all Medicaid eligible 
children and pregnant women as required by RSA 167 colon 68A. Is there a second? Second by Senator Susi. Discussion, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Um, the department has not done this rule making yet, although it's required by statute. I realize that there was not a vote to provide the funding, but um, I believe that department should undertake the rule making process as they are required. Further discussion, Senator Reagan. So my question is, how does this fit the requirement for an emergency rule? I can't, I've never been on jail car, so I, I'm okay, sorry. It requires that it be a threat to public safety or health. And this is just routine business for me. Well, I mean, I believe that um, home visiting is really important to a healthy baby in, for some women and a healthy pregnant woman. Thank you. For so the discussion. That it does not, Senator Reagan. It does not meet the threshold for an emergency rule. Thank you. Any further discussion? Senator Guida. I would ask a question as to why it hasn't been done under normal rulemaking if it's supposedly statutorily required. Look to the department, Mr. Lipman. Thank you. Um, we have been working on this rule. I think we have a substantial draft. Um, I, I think just in terms of the funding, lack of funding availability and, and some significant um, staff vacancies in, in the policy area, we've, we did the best we could. Um, I think we, we can get the rule done in pretty short order, whether this is voted or not. Um, I think that you know the the funding will will determine how much we can um, provide under the rule, um, but we certainly um, are prepared to finish the rule. Further discussion. Seeing none, uh, motion before us is item number fourteen. Call roll. Senator Morse. No. Senator Hennessy. No. Senator Susi. Yes. Senator Reagan. No. Senator Guida. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. Chair votes no. Motion fails two to five. Any further action on the Division of Medicaid Services? Seeing none. We'll go on to the next one, which is Division of Ch Children, Youth, and Families. Chairman? Senator Morse. Yeah, I don't think, I know Senator Rosenwald has a plan. The department um, is supposed to be getting us one shortly, but um, in, I mean, I'm just talking this out right now. The it makes no sense to me to have the appropriation we have in 22 um, be as high as it is. Um, and obviously in 23, if we were to function, because I don't believe there's a plan right now, um, the number would be smaller than 22. And then I think the plan would be to immediately put together some kind of commission that, um, comes back in January, because this probably is gonna involve some kind of construction um, and, and a well thought out plan. I don't believe we can get it closed in 23. I, I just, I wanna close it. So however we put language in the budget, we would say it's closing um, on such and such a date, but I think some group has to get working on this even to have it closed in two years. I mean, under today's construction schedule, I think that's tight. But um, if you were to build a smaller unit somewhere, but I think there's the numbers in the budget right now, if LBA can tell us the general funds in the budget. 
it's in the 12 million neighborhood. Let me look up the exact figure. At the 12,351,111? Yes. Does that 12 million include other or is that general funds? Actually, so I'm sorry, that 12.3 million would have been the amount in 23. The amount in 22 of general funds is 11.7 million. And there's another 1.4 million of other funds. Another 0.4 million, Ted? 1.4. 1.4 and another? So in 22, that's 13, one to take care of. 10 people. Yeah. Just, I'm not understanding how it's re realistic. Um, I don't know. I don't know if we can make a decision today, but it, it it's going to be an expense to our budget to keep it open in 23. Um, there's no way we're constructing a building in one year to house, say, 15 people. The, uh, and I don't think it's the kind of building where you could say you could go buy something, you know, not with the security that's involved. Has the department looked into contracting with other private org organizations that, that handle um, the, the, the youth that would be at Sununu Center? Could we have Director Ripson brought over? Could, could not understand. Uh, it, 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 it sounds like you get the reverb really high, Karen, so it's difficult. Oh, sorry. Could we have Director Ripson come over? Director. Good afternoon, Joe Ripson, Director of DCYF. And I might have missed something as I moved over, but I felt the question was about the potential of contract with a private provider to provide um, secure, detained, and commitment. Is that correct? I heard part of you, I heard part of your statement. Hard to understand you. Sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. The question, just so I make sure I understood it, was about privatizing um, the secure, detained, and commitment functions. Yes, in the community. Yeah. So we haven't we haven't gone through any formal process to look at potentially privatizing those functions. Um, I can share that the state of Vermont is trying to do that right now at an anticipated rate of about 1700 and change per day, um, which is, you know, not, I don't think would yield a tremendous cost savings, if any. I do have policy concerns about privatizing the only secured facility in the state for detained and committed population. Um, you know, by putting all your eggs in one basket, I think you run a risk of um, a provider potentially not being able to, to handle uh, what they've come up with. And then we have no option left for those children. So that would seriously concern me from a policy perspective. Um, but from a fiscal perspective, I, uh, I'm not sure that there would be tremendous cost savings yielded on your operational cost when you look at, you know, what say Vermont is planning to pay at about $1,700 a day. Okay. So I, I know that I know that there is a, a private group that has secure places in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And I just want to get an idea of uh, what the tuition what would be so that we can make some comparisons against you know, some of the figures we're looking at here. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I know there is no secured placement whatsoever in the state of New Hampshire other than SYSC for youth. So I'm not sure what private provider that could be. 
Senator Guida. The question, Mr. Chairman, to, uh, to uh, Director Ibsen. Joe, is, is there any group specifically dedicated to developing a proposal for replacing the Sununu Center? I mean, I hear I'm, I'm involved and I'm talking to you and other people, but I, I'm not aware if there's a committed, dedicated group focused on coming up with a plan to propose for the legislature. There are a number of individual conversations happening with various groups, um, but I am not aware of there being a formal group established at this moment to do that task, Senator Guida. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I just uh, take note of the fact that Friday in fiscal, we approved a contract in, to take kids from Vermont into the Sununu Center because Vermont doesn't have a replacement facility open yet. But I, I mean, I would go on to say that the budget for the Sununu Center grows every year. We are, the cost is now over a million dollars per person per year. And we've got, I think on the dashboard fiscal on Friday, there were 10 detained children at a cost of $13 million a year. We could find a better way to spend that money on children. And it's not effective because we see the same, some of the same kids come back, but I'm reluctant to move the closing period out beyond the biennium because I think something will come up to delay it. I could see closing it on the last day of the biennium, but I think if we don't force the closure, stasis will take over and it'll just keep going. Senator Moss. Uh, that, that was in other funds, I believe, correct? Correct. Right. I believe a portion of that may be revenue from schools. Is that correct, Karen? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear all of what Senator Moore said, but there is revenues from Department of Education in the SYC budget. It's not very much. Does that comprise the entirety of the $1.4 million? What's the $1.4 no. million in other? It's um, an estimate of... of potentially revenue from Vermont and the education funds. Karen, it looks like in 2020, your total spend was around $10 million. Is that true? I believe that to be correct. Um, Yes, I remember the general funds, but I don't remember the total request. Of, I believe that's around that, yes. Okay, we can barely hear you. The, um, 
I guess we need to know what to put in the general funds for 22 and 23. And then on House Bill 2, we can write language to have a closing date and to form some kind of body to get this done. Because uh, I think everybody's in agreement for that. But if it were um, 8.6 million and 8.6 million in general funds and 1.4 and 1.4 in other funds, um, would we be able to take care of these kids? So that total budget would be still $10 million, but we're relying on the other funds. Would it be 10 million a year? 10 million a year. I do believe we anticipate the Vermont contract ending before the um, end of the biennium. It's only gonna be utilized until their privatized program is open. I think that's why the other funds are lower in state fiscal year 23. Senator Rosenwald. Thanks. I'd like to just um, th throw into this discussion that there's been concern that we would have to pay back the federal government some multiple millions. But it's my understanding that office management and budget has already been directed to figure out a way to let states off the hook for that money. So that's going on separately, but I don't know why we can't take care of a kid for a million dollars a year instead of $1.3 million a year. And we've reduced the census, but we haven't in the last two years, as far as we can tell, reduced the staffing for Sununu. We've still got 45 youth counselors. So what, what we have done is reduced the funding of the positions that you are correct that the positions have not been abolished. Yeah, part of the part of the challenge has been around the, the hiring and retention of youth counselors in particular. Um, so part of the real challenge around identifying the cost is that um, since there aren't enough youth counselors to cover all the shifts all the time, sometimes there's juvenile justice probation officers who come in and cover shifts, but they don't show up in the SYSC budget. Um, so that's part of what you're probably seeing in state fiscal year 20 around the, uh, the total expenditure being less. I would also add that the, the number of serving 10 youth I think is misleading. The average daily census in state fiscal year 19 was 17. Um, I think I haven't calculated it for state fiscal year 20 yet, but it'll probably be in the low teens. The census varies on any given day from about, you know, eight to about 18. I think just last month we had a couple days where we were at 18 or so. Um, and it's incredibly dynamic, the number of youth who come and go on a, on a weekly basis. Uh, I think we served about a total of 80 youth last year in the building, even though at any given time there might only be about, you know, on average, I'd say probably in the low teens. 13 or 14 in state fiscal year 20. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Is in House Bill 254 included in House Bill 2, Representative Rice's bill that will uh, make statutory changes to, and lead us towards reducing the potential population of Sununu over the next few years by restricting the eligibility. House Bill 254 does limit the number of offenses that could get a youth in on the first offense. Um, I'm not sure that it's gonna have a huge impact on the total daily census as I've shared with the, uh, the advocates who supported that bill because there are other provisions in the law that still allow youth to be committed or detained based on multiple lesser offenses which is how the vast majority of youth at SYSC end up there. Most of them have, you know, a dozen or so underlying offenses before they end up at SYSC. What I do believe is gonna help drive down the census is the system of care work that's ongoing. I think that's what's legitimately gonna to continue to push down the number of committed youth and hopefully also reduce the number of detained youth that are going into the facility. So I do agree with everyone's analysis that the total census of SYSC is on a decline and it's gonna to continue to decline. I just prefer to be careful about not 
um, not leaving us without an appropriate option for the census that we do have. Senator Morse. Yeah, in order to try to get something drafted so that we can get an understanding where we are and move general funds in 22 and 23 at 9 million per year and other funds at 1.4 and 22 and 922, um, 157 in uh, 23. And when I write language for the closing and for addressing how to get to the closing, I will write language that lets 22 laps in the 23 in there so that if there's any carry forward, they can, uh, use it to get through 23. And second it with a question. Seconded by Senator Rosenwald. Would that also include a closing date in March of 2023? Yeah, that's, that's how I'll write it for Wednesday. I'll write a closing date, a commission to react immediately. And, but I also, we're giving them uh, 10.4 million, we're not giving it to them. They have to run it on 10.4 million. I understand the stress of all this, but if, the, if that, <coughs> it seems like that would work based on 2020. <coughs> it, and if there's anything left over, they could drag that into 23. I mean, it's not like we won't be here in January if this is headed south, so. I have one more question if I could about Follow this. up. In the current budget, we had a provision in House Bill 2 that the department could not transfer money into Sununu. And a couple times they moved money around in Sununu, but they couldn't cut money from elsewhere in their budget to bulk up that budget. Would you be willing to carry that language over? It's up to the committee. I mean, that we can can help design this thing for Wednesday if you want. I'm happy to. <laughs> so, I, th I think the amendment coming forward on Wednesday yeah. is to get to the point where the legislature wants to get to. I think there's a huge step in between here because you brought it all up. One, maybe or maybe not, we have to pay back the federal government. And two, you know, if we were to build an 11 or $12 million structure and it's still costing $7 million to operate it, um that group's got to think about things you know it's so i and those are the numbers i've heard so. i'm happy to work with great you. place for a school for manchester under the guide thank you mr chairman um joe are all the kids down at sununu requiring secure lockup yeah they're all court ordered to be in a secure facility there's no other way that a youth is allowed to enter SYSC. Follow up. So if you were to propose an additional, a new facility, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the target number you would estimate would be appropriate? You know, and I, I think that's gonna be one of the real challenges for this work group, because I think it's gonna to continue to be a moving target over the coming years as the system of care work continues. Um, my, my feeling, what I would be safe with, would be thinking that you probably need to plan operationally to be serving around 12 youth at a time, but that you probably need some flexible space because youth come with different needs, different genders, et cetera, and they don't always come in the same groupings, right? So we could have five girls one day and none the next, or one. Um, we could have youth who are court ordered to be separated because they're involved in gang activities together or they were involved in a common criminal activity and the court doesn't want them residing in the same space or because their clinical and treatment needs are different. So I think your physical capacity needs to have um, flexibility to have groupings of children that would be larger than just serving 12 at a time. Um, but I think operationally 12 is the number that I would think about. Thank you. Any further discussion? Motion on the floor, Senator Morse's amendment that was seconded by Senator Rosenwald. Seeing no further discussion, call roll, Senator Morse. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Senator Susi. Yes. 
Senator Reagan? Yes. Senator Guida? Yes. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. And the chair votes yes. And the motion carries. Uh, just a question for LBA. Um, how is, is is what we're doing with number one in any way going to affect number three? No, nope. not sure if we're I'm looking. I'm sorry. Number, okay. Yeah, number I two. I got my notes on the old version. <laughs> No Number problem. Two. Um, I think the answer is yes, it would. However, the amendment that I believe Senator Morris is working on would take care of this. Okay. So it's not something you need to address right now. Right. Well, we can hold on that till Wednesday. Okay. Going on to the division on behavioral health. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by moving number eight with a correction to Senator Radley's language. Um, Senator, uh, Senator Rosenwald moves item number eight. Is there a second? Second by Senator Guida. Senator so, Rosenwald. Um, his amendment and mine before, which is item number seven, both restore an appropriation to senior centers that the governor's budget made, but um, his funds it out of 21 surplus, which I like, but there was new language on what it could be used for that was worked out with the senior centers that just clarified it was for uh, programs that would address mental health and not random capital uh, project. So my suggestion for Senator Bradley's amendment is that we knock out the language that starts on line six with including but not limited to provide grants for safety upgrades and other capital improvements to enhance their facilities so that it just the purpose ends with social isolation. That was language that was worked out with the Coalition for Healthy Aging. Is there, a, is there a motion on Senator Rosenwell's amendment? Uh, excuse me, a second on that. A second by Senator Susi. Senator Moss? Yeah, I just want to clarify the couple things going on here. In 2021, Veterans Mental Health and Social Isolation Services, I picked that up already. I'm assuming that's not here. Senior um, Mental Health and Social Isolation Services, that's what we're picking up here? Yes, this was part of the governor's budget and the house dropped it. Okay. So we're picking up both those numbers in 21. So. Yes, okay. but the other one we already did I yep. think, didn't we? Further discussion? Senator Guida? Yeah, I, was there funding for any capital improvements in the original ask? I believe that the original ask could have been used uh, for, for safety upgrades and other capital improvements. Right, I'm not sure. Language that Senator Rosenwald chose to strike out. Right, I'm not sure if if there was an ask for capital improvements based on the interaction with the committee or the commission. We might want to consider reducing 1.5 by the amount of those capital uh, projects that were included in that figure. That's the reason for my question. And I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. Do, is there a department aware of of the 1.5 million that was requested? as to uh, a breakout of how much was for safety upgrades and capital improvement? No, I, I would defer that question to the governor's office. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Senator Morse. Yeah, I think the intention was to, on seven, to fund that out of federal funds. 
and then eight to fund out of twenty one dollars. Out of general funds. So seven we'd pick up while we're working this summer um, with federal rescue funds. Follow up. Senator Guida? Yeah, so I'm showing general on item seven on the handout, but you're saying that that's going to be picked up by ARPA? Yeah, on here I have federal funds. Okay. And there's only one bucket of federal funds that I know about. So that's. All right. There, in June, there'll be a mental health to deal with DRS, but I think mental health is going to require Republicans and Democrats to be at the table. We just, it's going to take time in the summer. But that's where we were talking about getting the funds. Further discussion? Motion before us is item number eight with the Ro Rosenwald Amendment. Ready for the question? Senator Morse? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator Susi? Yes. Senator Reagan? Yes. Senator Guida? Yes. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. Chair votes yes and motion carries. Chairman? Senator Morse? I believe I want to move item number six. Um, you guys that follow Senate Bill, Senate Bill 157. So, by number. It is. Kevin, can you help me? Sorry, item number six was a department request uh, to make the system of care contracts fund, uh, system of care line non-lapsing. I'm sorry, was there a question about Senate Bill 157 yes. as well? The question was about 157. Okay. Where is it? Well, you have voted to incorporate Senate Bill 157 into House Bill 2, so it would be in there. Uh, as far as where the bill is right now in the Senate. No, is so do we need this language in line six? I don't believe you need it. Uh, uh, okay. I'll, I'll bring, I'll take my motion back, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And Senate Bill 157 has passed. That's a question. It hasn't passed yet. It's on the table in the Senate. But we're picking it up in HB2? Yes. Yes. Mr. Chair, may I add something there? Yes. I believe that that Senate bill makes it non-lapsing from uh, 21 to 22, and this request would make it non-lapsing from 22 to 23. Josh, can you help me out? House Bill 2 language, do you have it? Because basically what the department's saying is our language doesn't take it the second year. That was my understanding of the Senate bill, but I most certainly could be wrong. So this is Katya Fox um, from the Division for Behavioral Health. If I could clarify, this is totally separate from the SB 157 action that you took last week. This is to add a class note that we have in many, many of our accounts um, that allow us the flexibility should we not expend the funds in 22, that they not lapse until 23 so that we don't run into the situation where we have, um, as we just did um, in the last biennium, where we have funds that lapse, um, but are um, needed um, to support the system of care. So you'll see that class note in other areas of the agency and the division. And it just allows us to have what essentially is um, the ability to carry funds over without them lapsing between the two years of the biennium. Thank you. Josh, did we pick that language up or not? 
So in the Senate Bill 157 language, the 21 appropriation shall not lapse until June 30th, 2022. So if there's any money left over, it would lapse at the end of fiscal 22. This language would allow the department to carry it over into 23. Okay, I'll move item number six. Senator Morse moves item number six, a seconded by Senator Guida. Discussion? There being none, Senator Morse. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator, Senator Susie. Yes. Senator Reagan. Yes. Senator Guida. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And the chair votes yes. Motion carries. Any further action? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I have a question of the department. Are items one and two, does that include well, item number one, particularly the step up, step down services that were um, part of Senate Bill 14 and the 10 year mental health plan. So again, Katya Fox from the uh, division. No, this was funding that currently supports our crisis um, uh, stabilization services that when we were developing the budget, it was at a point in time when we expected state revenues to take a dramatic turn downward. And we were asked to present a budget that would trim costs. And so we offered this up through the governor's or the agency request phase. Um, and so this is to restore those funds. It, it, it was for current crisis response programs. It was not the new funding that we received for a step up, step down. Oh, it was the, to bring it back to where it had been. Correct, yep, that, this will bring it back to um, a, a programs that are currently running. Okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, you said it's gonna bring it back to what? to what we currently have in place for services for crisis stabilization. Again, we offered up something to cut because we are all under the impression that we were gonna have horrible revenues and our budget needed to come in um, much lower or lower anyway, department wide. And this is what we offered up through that phase. So we've requested, um, fortunately, we've seen the revenues um, not do what we expected we've asked to restore this funding so we can continue our crisis programs. Okay, so how, mu how much did the governor cut or reduce your budget from the current biennium? So this was an agency request, so it was not actually the governor who um, cut it. Um, we did it prior to submitting it to the governor's office. It was our agency request. Okay, because I have a note that says that the house, what the house uh, put in the budget was eight million dollars more than the governor. So, Karen, I would look. That, to that was that. just that was transferred from another accounting unit. So that that increase that the house did was not an increase of the total budget that was moved from accounting unit twenty fifty three, I believe. Mr. Chair. Senator Hennessy. Didn't we support that transfer by backfilling where the house transferred from last week? I don't know that I understand the question. What, what do you like backfilling in 2053? I'll have to look at my notes, but I thought that the, the transfer that the house made from one department to another, we, the Senate, put that funding back from where the house transferred it from. I don't recall that. Yeah, if I could, I don't think the Senate voted on that. The, the department did ask you to, to uh, restore a, a portion of the funding. It's on line two on this page, that 1.46 million roughly for the system of care, but the uh, Senate hasn't acted on that. Senator Moss. Yeah, can we hold on item one through five until uh, 
check with the governor's office on how they want to handle this. No objection. Okay. Is there anything else under behavioral health anyone wishes to address? Seeing nothing, we will go on to the Division of Public Health Services. Senator Rosewald. Thank you. I'd like to move items number one and two. Senator Rosenwald moves items one and two. Is there a second? I'll second it for discussion, Mr. Chairman. Seconded by Senator Moss for discussion. Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Senator Moss. Can someone run through, let's just with item number one, what's in the budget now and what was in it for 21 on item number one? Sure. So on item number one, this $600,000 was included in the budget previous in fiscal year 20 and 21 when it was presented as a request uh, during the budget session for 2021, it was often referred to as parental assistance funds. It was in accounting unit 2958. Uh, I can tell you the class line in just one second. Uh, Class line 645. Um, they were appropriated to DCYF. However, the funds really uh, aligned better with the work that Economic and Housing Stability was doing, which there was a request in that division, and what public health, the work that public health does. So during uh, the budget um, preparation, a, to Katya's point earlier, there was discussion around potentially uh, having to make very large budget reductions. And so this was an area that we moved it to a prioritized need. Although uh, with regards to number one, these contracts are currently in place. So Karen, is there any money in the budget for these lines at all? No. And that would be the same for item two? I don't know that item two was previously in 2958. Um, let me just look. I don't believe, I, I would have to double check, but I don't believe that one was a parental assistance. I'd, I'd have to confirm. And I don't see. Aaron, as we've gone through things today, we seem to have hit a number of different uh, funds looking for home visitation. I'm wondering how much duplication we have in all this. So I don't believe there is duplication. There was a lot of discussion around that last uh, biennium when they were adding, adding the language around home visiting. Um, I don't see, Henry is still on. He may be, Henry Lippman may be able, Director Lippman might be able to speak to uh, the duplication of effort there. Hi, Karen. So Henry, they were just asking uh, when are, regarding home visiting. What yes. is the, the difference between the home visiting that Medicaid is doing and public health is doing and is there a potential overlap? And I remember there was a lot of discussion around that last biennium. Um, there, there is um, a difference between the two. I think there's is more 
general, but I, uh, I'm not sure I, from an authority I can answer the difference, uh, Karen. Um, if you give me, a, I can circle back. If you just give me a few minutes, I can uh, reach out and get the staff person who knows more about that. Okay. Hey, Karen, and while, while he's looking up that, did you say that there was not any money in the budget for home visiting? No, I believe that there are some funds. This would be additional funds. Yeah, I, I see 2.8 uh, in 23 and 2.8 in 22. Both the governor and the uh, house kept the same figures. Correct. Correct, and that's a 100% federal grant. And these would be general funds to expand that. Any further discussion while Henry's looking up those figures? I'm, I'm one. Yeah. <clears throat> Question. Senator Guida. So look at the numbers in the compare report for 20 actual and 21 adjusted authorized. Uh, that's about the $600,000 difference, give or take. But I, my question is, is that significant increase relative to COVID? And will that, will the uh, home visiting formula grant, if it was in fact elevated because of COVID, in fact, come back down? as we see COVID recede. So I believe that Patricia Tilly um, was able to join us as was uh, Sai, um, and I believe that they both will be able to answer those questions. Sai Shirley, Hi, Patricia. Good afternoon. This is Trish Tilly. I don't know if Dr. Trala has been able to jump on yet. Um, and Senator Gaida, I only heard a little bit of your question. Um, so if you don't mind repeating, uh, I'll see if I can answer or, or we can get Dr. Trala to answer. Trish, I'm here. Oh, great. Thank you. So thank you, Senator Gaida. If you could repeat the question. Sure. So the question was, as I look uh, from the actual in 20 to the adjusted authorized in 21, obviously, uh, $600,000 give or take increase. <clears throat> My question is, is that increase COVID related and do we expect it to mitigate going forward as COVID comes, if you will, uh, uh, it becomes a much less of a factor. Great, I, I'll take a first swing at that. Thank you for the question. And then I'll let Dr. Trella fill in any details that, I, uh, that, that need to be filled in. So that $600,000 um, for home visiting is not specifically COVID related at all. It's to continue to do the work out in the community. Um, what we found last year, we had uh, we did some specific COVID related work where we needed to work more remotely and provide additional different kinds of supports to the programs. Um, but what we're anticipating in this coming year and in the next biennium is the continued need to make sure that we connect families to um, the services that are available. Um, specifically in home visiting, we wanna ensure that we get our substance exposed infants connected to services prior to becoming engaged with DCYF. Um, and so we have done a pilot project. Um, we provided some detail about that earlier. Uh, we provided a, we did a, pro, a pilot project in two communities in Concord, Laconia, and we feel like we're ready to expand that across the state now. Um, so the short answer to your question is no, it is not specific to COVID um, for this additional funding. Dr. Trella, is there something that I missed? No, Trish, you haven't missed anything, but uh, that's an accurate reflection. It's specifically meant for um, helping families where they have a substance-exposed infant and linking them. 
and also helping other families to get other resources through home visiting. So this pilot is one part of it, but we also use these uh, resources, the other funds also to support other families who needed extra support in the home visiting. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So is there any way or have you developed any sense of measuring the diversion away from DCYF as a result of this program? Yes, uh, we go ahead, Trish, do you want to talk about it? No, no, we'll, we'll continue. So we continue, um, so these would be new funds. So um, we have measures in place right now where or date, we collect that data about who becomes involved with the DCYF system. We know um, from the model that this is based off of, um, which is a program called Healthy Families America. It's an evidence-based model that's used around the country. We know that there has been a reduction in families engaged with the child protective services when you use the model with fidelity, which we have in New Hampshire. So we have every reason to believe that by using this model as they've done in other states, we will continue to see that our rates will, um, we will reduce that in New Hampshire as well. Um, we know also from the model in New Hampshire that we've had other outcomes like reducing the number of premature births, which has a huge fiscal impact to um, the Medicaid budget and to other components to the healthcare system. And we've also you know, seen other um, positive benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Can you define community collaboration? Dr. Tarala, would you like to define that? Sure. Community collaboration. Um, it's a it's a uh, it's a federal grant that supports um, our program. Uh, it's through our American uh, uh, Family Services grant. What actually the community collaborations uh, provides is it's called community Coll collaborations to strengthen and preserve families. Uh, it's basically an integrated continuum of family support. So continue supporting the family. So they are the across the system. So we are supporting the community-based services so the families can get those services. So this actually will help us to in an effort to prevent child abuse and maltreatment. And ultimately, it also the idea is to reduce ch children entering the foster care. Um, this is specifically focused on three sites in our in our state. Um, these are our Amaskeek um, in Manchester, our Lakes region in the public health networks of Lakes region, as well as our North Country. The, those three sites we have we have used those three sites to do this. And this is specifically again focused on that primary and secondary prevention and for the families with children zero to eight years old. Thank you. Any further discussion? The motion before us is the adoption of items one and two. Ready for the question? Call roll, Senator Morse. No. Senator Hennessy. Senator Susie. Yeah. Senator Reagan. Senator Guida. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And the chair votes no. The motion fails two to five. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I'd like to move item number three. Senator Rosenwald moves item number three. Is there a second? Second by Senator Susi. Any discussion? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Um, we discussed this subject last week um, when we tried to put in three quarters worth of funding until federal funding is available again. That did not move forward, but I'm an optimist. Um, I don't believe $400,000 will be enough, but um, I I'm moving the department's request for this program forward. I believe it gets us healthier mothers and babies. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call roll. Senator Morse? No. Senator Hennessy? Senator Susie? Yes. 
Senator Reagan? Senator Guida? Senator Rosenwald? Yes. The chair votes no. The motion fails two to five. Now, if we'll turn over to the sheet that was handed out earlier today, one that uh, dated today at the top, it says prepared for Senator Moss and Hennessy. Uh, recognize the LBA. Sure. So the first three items on this list all relate to fiscal 21 funds that the department anticipates lapsing. And this would make those funds instead non-lapsing and used in fiscal 22. Uh, so number one pertains to long-term care services. The department expects to lapse 11 million this fiscal year. So this would reduce general funds uh, in account 2152 by $11 million and increase other funds. And those other funds are simply the non-lapsing funds that are carried over. And you can see that on page two of the handout. This is account 2152 waiver nursing facility payments. And I think you can clearly see here that total funds being spent in this accounting unit remain unchanged from the house. And likewise, the county contribution remains unchanged from the house. The only thing that's changing is swapping 22 general funds for those uh, non-lapsing 21 general funds. Number two on the summary sheet, I've already discussed, but I'll go over this again briefly. It's the same thing. Uh, the department expects to have $17 million uh, that would lapse from Medicaid. This would make those funds non-lapsing and allow the department to use them in managed care. So there are two accounts affected here. The first is CHIP. That is on page three of the handout. As you may recall, the department requested uh, funding for CHIP to be reduced. This would make those department requested changes and it would increase funding in Medicaid care management, which is on the following page, page four. There's only a $1.6 million increase in general funds reflected here. However, uh, as the explanation states down below, the department would be able to use that 17 million that's non-lapsing. So the combined 18.6 million would fully satisfy the department's request uh, for Medicaid managed care. Number three on the summary sheet is again, something similar. The department anticipates lapsing between five and 6 million uh, for the state loan repayment program. This would take approximately 1.5 million of that. It's actually 1,533,566 and make it non-lapsing until the end of 23. And although there's no accounting unit level detail here because it's pretty straightforward, it would basically reduce the, eliminate the general funds that are budgeted in that accounting unit in 22 and 23 and replace them with the non-lapsing funds from fiscal 21. And if you're curious about that exact accounting unit, Hold on just one second. It's on page 1191 of your compare report and it's class line, oh, I've lost it. It's class line 103 contracts for, uh, for operating services. And you can see that $766,783 figure that would simply be a swap of general funds for the non-lapsing 21 funds. Number four would reduce appropriations for the state phase down by $2 million per year and make appropriations non-lapsing from fiscal 22 to 23. And number five would reduce Medicaid to schools by $15 million per year. Those are all federal funds and add a fiscal reporting requirement in House Bill 2 that would require the department to come to fiscal if they need additional funds beyond what's appropriated in the budget and explain to fiscal what they're doing to assist school districts in meeting the requirements needed to obtain those federal funds. And combined, all these changes would reduce total funds in the budget by 60.2 million in fiscal 22 and 23. Senator Reagan. Senator Reagan moves the amendment. Senator Guida seconds discussion. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. What is the total gen general fund impact over the biennium? 
It would reduce general funds by 23.9 million over the biennium. Senator Hennessy. Thank you. I just wanted to speak to uh, number five, the reduction in the by $15 million a year in the Medicaid to schools program. If we look at fiscal year 19, the actual spend in this was $8.2 million in 20, uh, that was in 20, in the fiscal year 21, it's estimated to be 12.5. However, the budget was $45 million. And the budget right now for 22 is 30, 23 is um, 32. And this is all federal funds. And the reason why I included this, and you have probably heard from many of your schools that because of Medicaid re, um, requirements that had changed, uh, Medicaid services used to be on a student's IEP, but some of those are now required to be signed off by a medical professional. And so school, a lot of school districts are having a difficult time transitioning to this. So they're losing this funding. And in some cases it can be quite a lot of funding. So to help the school districts get the funding they need and the department and with a conversation with the department, they are happy to do this. I've asked that this budget line be reduced and that the department report to fiscal on what they are doing to help ensure that our schools are receiving these Medicaid dollars. Thank you. Any further questions? And also the amendment 1641S goes along with this. Any further discussion? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I have a question for Senator Hennessy. Um, in this biennium, we appropriated six and a half million dollars for the state loan repayment. What's the total appropriation you're contemplating with this reduction for the next two years? So for the, for the next biennium, it is just what was currently budgeted. However, I believe there are significant dollars coming into the state that could help to increase that, um, to help our workforce development that we could use federal dollars for. Further discussion? Motion before us is the adoption of the Moss and Hennessy Amendment. Call roll, Senator Moss? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator Susi? No. Senator Reagan? Yes. Senator Guida? Yes. Senator Roosevelt? No. And the chair votes yes. Motion carries five to two. Okay, if you'd now turn to a uh, document, it says uh, dated 524, uh, Senate Finance Committee pending recaps items. The first one is the Treasury Department. Can we hold on treasury? Can we go up? Hold on treasury. Can we put a hold on the treasury? Department of State. Oh, we did this last week. I don't think we did anything with the Department of State last week, did we? I'm sorry? Department of State, did we do anything with that last week? Uh, actually, the only two things left are the House Bill 2 things. Um, 
How, how are we on the university and college? We're not, we're not ready. Well, I, I don't think so because what I want to do is actually to go through and take House Bill 1 stuff. House Bill 2, we can take up as, as we go through. Uh, uh, I guess we could take them up now and save time later. Did we? Chairman, did we vote on anything in the Department of State yet? Uh, I thought we voted on number three. No, I had I had number three and number four as being held. What's that? Yes. I didn't do anything. Well, I think the first the first two were actually were questions, I guess. So the only thing that's in there were House Bill two items. And I believe Senator Rosenwell did did uh, talk about moving three and said, you know, could we take them up later since four pertains to the same thing? Executive. Department of Employment Security, are we still working? No, I employment security, I I think we can move the department's budget as presented by the House, but I also think there's something we should discuss afterwards. And the only reason I'm accepting changes in the uh, they they basically made several changes on the discounts they did not make a change in the first discount the first discount at 250 million is still a half a point um, and that's still in place so the only effect that we'll have in the discount changes will be when we get to 275 million which will take four years to get there. Um, so I think in four years, we can figure out if we really want to make these discount changes. The, um, but the, uh, the reality is um, there's nothing different going on right now in the percentages we're charging, so. Okay. So are you, are you moving their, their budget? I'll move it as presented by the House. Okay, Senator Morse moves the, the figures for the Department of Employment Security as adopted by the House. So a second? Second by Senator Reagan. Discussion? There being none, uh, we'll call roll. Senator Morse? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Senator Susi. Yes. Senator Reagan? Yes. Senator Guida? Yes. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. The chair votes yes. And employment security has been adopted. Mr. Chairman? Senator Morse? Hey, this is probably a Wednesday discussion, but I just want to go over it. Um, the um, the way it's set up in New Hampshire right now under the emergency orders, um, they're set to expire at the end of June. Whether that'll happen or not, I'm not sure. But the reality is on nonprofits, um, right now, 50% of the nonprofits are being, of their layoffs are being covered. Um, I better not screw this up. Um, 
by the federal government. And I believe the trust funds carrying the other 50%. Um, so nonprofits would be everything from what you think of as a nonprofit to a hospital. Um, if that were to expire, then it'd be 100% on the nonprofits, um, which I suppose some good about that is, um, you know, we start to look at, can we get people back in the workforce? The federal government has a program till September 6th that funds um, the nonprofits at 75%. Um, the other 25% um, would probably get picked up by the nonprofit because you could figure if it was going to expire at the end of June, they'd be picking up 100%. Um, there is a federal program that my first knowledge of it, I, I went on a call with the commissioner um, that will kick in and cover the 75% um, until September in the uh, which would help the nonprofits, the, uh, and he couldn't tell me if that would be extended or not extended. Um, the discussion would be about the balance of the 25%, um, who would pick that up. Um, so it's something we need to address by Wednesday because it seems like a back of the budget language thing if, we, if we're gonna tackle it. Um, the uh, so first I've heard of it, so. I got to do some homework. Okay. Want to add on the agriculture uh, thing too. There was one thing that didn't seem to make it on the sheet, and uh, Commissioner Jasper had requested a da data entry uh, position, um, something I guess that was required in and to enable. Um, farmers in New Hampshire to send milk out of state. He was lo looking for $100,000. I believe that was 50 in each year. <clears throat> LBA, are you, are you familiar with that request? In the packet? Yes. Yes, Mr. Chair, that came in the form of an email, I believe, to the committee members. Okay. It had to do with uh, testing for um, certain uh, diseases and the export of milk from New Hampshire. So, and, and for people looking on that packet that was handed out, it's on page 12. Amendment 1629S. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> so, there's so actually more. three things in agriculture. <coughs> two of them are in HB2. Uh, the, the position we want to deal with that and approve agriculture's budget, we could deal with that today. Um, the HB2 things, I think we should wait till Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Senator Moore. the position. Senator Morse moves Amendment 1629S. Is there a second? Mr. I'll, Chair. I'll, I'll second it. Who, who was just speaking? Sorry, oh. to, sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I believe the motion is just for that position listed in 1629S. That amendment also in, includes an appropriation for the cost of the care. The position is on line 13 of that amendment. $53,000 in the first year, 58 in the second year. Yeah, I, I'm not ready to move cost of care and the animal records database. I thought they were both in HB2. Yeah, but what he's saying is in the amendment, there's another one, 
in there that I hadn't heard. Wait a minute. Should I establish for the department uh, a word processor position? Such position shall enter and compile test data. And I think that's all the same. Yes, we have the information to put that position in House Bill 1, if that's what the committee would like to do. Okay, and I think... Yeah, this is a $500,000 decision plus or minus um, each year. So I, I think we have to get our math straight before we start to look at this. And we still have mental health to deal with. The, the position I thought was a separate thing for $50,000. Okay, so should we just draft up another amendment to just that, that position? Or can we just, just go ahead and... If you just it. approve the position, we can make the changes to House Bill 1 and then we'll discard this amendment and redraft it without the position. Mr. Chairman, are we, are we, we're meeting tomorrow, right? Yes. You might be able to clean it up by tomorrow. I, I don't know. Why, why, don't, why don't we put it off tomorrow so we can clean it up and know what we're voting on? Uh, let's, let's, how are we with the Department of Safety? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I have a question on agriculture still. Okay, go ahead. So, as I recall, there's an appropriation for $100,000 for a database. Is that in House Bill 2? There's, there's two appropriations. One for a database for $250,000. 250, dollars okay, yeah. And one for cost of care at somewhere around 200,000. Right. And then one for a position. And I don't know if that's 50,000 a year or 50,000 one year. I believe it's 50, well, 53 and 58. So you're at $550,000. God oh, bless you. All right, so when are we gonna take up that tomorrow? We'll, we'll probably take it up tomorrow. Thank you. In the Department of Safety. As I understand that these are all things that did not make it into the house bill. No, but after meeting with the governor's office, the, uh, I mean, the house obviously didn't have the revenues the Senate has right now. Um, I need 24 hours to go through this, but I, I met with the department. Uh, Senator D'Alessandro was the one that I sent over there originally to go through this and they came back with 20 million and then they came back again after I talked to them for 10 million. Um, I think there's a few things in here that could be cleaned up and uh, there's probably some kind of, we could probably get to where we have to get. So I just, I, did, I didn't work on it over the weekend. So. Okay, why don't, uh, why don't we, we call it a day then? We've got, we've got things we can organize for tomorrow. Um, but ask of the department any of the questions that were out there that, that uh, you haven't been able to give answers to, if you could, have those for us, we'd appreciate it so that we can continue with our work. And I think 
tomorrow we are scheduled to meet at one o'clock. But I'll, that I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by the Senator Rosenwell, seconded by Senator Susie. Uh, Senator Hennessy is a yes. Senator Morse. Yes. Senator, yes. Senator Susie, yes. Senator Rager, Senator Guida, Senator Rosenwald. Yes. Chair votes yes, and it is unanimous. We are adjourned. Thank you all.